We just read these words. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Now, it's interesting to note that uh, Jesus was walking from the north shores of the Sea of Galilee, uh, heading up north. There, right on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee is a, a town called Bethsaida. And Jesus had been there and was ministering to people there. And he chose to take his disciples north to another town by the name of Caesarea Philippi. It's not a short jaunt. It's 23 miles. And on foot, it takes a, a good long day. So you can imagine that they're going along their way, that they're kind of killing the time as they're talking about this and that life, you know. And, and then they get close to Caesarea Philippi, and they get up there, and Jesus turns to his disciples and says, so, you've been talking to the people. Who do they say that I am? Well, he gives a couple answers, you know. The first one, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist had already been beheaded. He was no longer alive. Some say you're Elijah. Well, Elijah had been taken by God into heaven centuries before. And others say you're one of the prophets. Now, well, folks, these aren't really bad answers. All right, they're, they're actually really pretty good answers because, you know, John the Baptist was a, a powerful preacher, and Elijah, man, he was a mighty man of God. It'd be kind of like the people coming, you know, Jesus coming in here and saying, you know, who do people say that I am? Well, we might say, oh, you know, some people say you're a good teacher. Some people say, well, you know, you're a great man of God, a, a good man. Uh, others say that in their religion, that you're a mighty prophet. And others would say, you know, you're a good example you know, of how to live life here on this earth and how to get along in society. You know, Jesus, you ought to write a book about that. But instead they said, you know, you're John the Baptist, or some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're one of those other prophets and like I said, those weren't bad answers. It'd be kind of like today saying, some people say you're the, um, the second coming of Billy Graham. Or you're um, the second coming of the great Oswald Hoffman, the speaker of the Lutheran Hour. Who wouldn't want to be compared to them, right? And not only that, but Elijah and John the Baptist and these prophets, every one of them in one way or another was associated with the coming of the Messiah but Jesus wasn't satisfied. So what Jesus did is he turned to his disciples and he said, um, who do you say that I am? So this morning I decided I'd like to ask you to consider that question. If Jesus was to walk into this room today, sit down next to you and whisper in your ears and say, who do you say that I am? What would you say? Do I have any takers that would like to give an answer to that one? Who do you say that I am? Okay, Dave, who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. You are the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. Anybody else? Yes, sir, Mike. You're my Savior, my friend. You're my Savior, my friend. All right, anybody else have another answer they'd like to share? Yes, sir. Yes, I would question to find out if he is the Messiah. How would you know? That would be kind of hard to tell, wouldn't it? But you're walking with him. And he walks up to you and says, who do you say that I am? It would be hard, wouldn't it? It would. It would be hard. Well, you know, some of the answers you guys gave today were exactly the same answer that Peter gave. Peter said... You are the Christ. Well, now that's Greek for you are the Messiah. And that's Hebrew for you are the Savior that we've been waiting for for thousands of years, ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin. Good answer. In fact, it was so good that the Lord was pleased with Peter's, Peter's answer. 
And if we look at the same story in the book of, of Matthew, we hear that the Lord is so pleased that He blesses Peter. He said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for what you have received is not of flesh and blood, but it's of the Father. And he said, now your name's going to be Peter, Rocky, and upon this rock I am going to build my church. Upon this confession of faith that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the promised Savior, the Christ, that will be the foundation of everything we believe. And the Lord was pleased with that answer. And folks, I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but we do the very same thing here every Sunday morning. We make that very proclamation. We say, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Say it with me. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. We say that together every Sunday. And you know what I think happens up in heaven? I think Jesus looks down and says, blessed are you, people of peace. I'm giving you a new name, children of God. And upon this foundation... That confession of faith that you have just made, I'm going to build my church. We say it, don't we? And we believe it. And when we say it and confess it, we mean it, don't we? Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. Foundation of His church, foundation of our lives. But let's be honest, sometimes it's kind of hard to live it, isn't it? So have you been wondering why there's three chairs up here? I want to tell you a story. It's not my story. It's a story I heard from a pastor a number of weeks ago. He was talking about when he was a student at the seminary in St. Louis, and he was on his way home for one of the, the class breaks. He found himself in a layover in O'Hare Airport, and he sat down in one of the, the seats in the airport. He looked to his right, and there sitting in the right chair, just to the right of this young man, was a young lady with Down syndrome. This young lady, young lady looked at him, and she had this beautiful smile that lit up the world. And there wasn't a shy bone in this young lady's uh, life, in her body. She was so happy to start up a conversation. She looked at him and said, so are you having a nice day, a good day? And he looked at her and smiled. He said, yes, I'm having a wonderful day. That's good. Everybody should have a good day. So, did you brush your teeth this morning? <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I brushed my teeth this morning when I got up and before I started my day. That's good. Everybody should brush their teeth. So, do you believe in Jesus? Yes, I believe in Jesus with all my heart. That's good. Everybody should believe in Jesus. I'm going to ask you something. This girl that is sitting in this right hand chair, does she love Jesus? How do we know? First of all, she says it, right? But she also lives it. To love Jesus and to believe in Jesus is just as natural a part of her life as brushing her teeth in the morning. To strike up a conversation with somebody about Jesus is just as natural as asking them whether they're having a good day or not. To talk about the weather. Or to say, how about them Broncos? Who do you think their quarterback's going to be next season? 
No problem talking about those things, right? And for this young lady, it was just as natural and a part of her life to love Jesus and to believe in him as to brush her teeth or to strike up a conversation about the weather. We know that that girl loves Jesus because she not only talked about it, but she lived it. So as they're sitting there and having this little conversation, a, a third person comes, a man dressed in this, this very expensive, beautiful suit, all dressed to the, the T. He sits down, shakes out his, his uh, Wall Street Journal, and he begins to read. The guy in the middle seat suddenly feels this nudge from his right and a whisper ask him. <laughs> Sir, um, my friend over here wants to know, are you having a good day? And the guy puts his paper down and he kind of looks over to see who's over there and he sees who she is and he gives a, gets a smile on his face and he says, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm having a very good day. Thank you for asking. He goes back to reading his paper. Another nudge. Ask him again. <laughs> um, sir, my friend and I would kind of like to know, did you brush your teeth this morning? <laughs> well, that one brought a real smile to the guy's face. He puts his, his paper down. He looks over at the young girl and he says, you know, I did. I brushed my teeth this morning before I went to work. You know what's coming, don't you? <laughs> Ask him that other question. And that young pastor in training lets out a little sigh. And with a little bit of reluctance, turns and he looks at the man and he says, my friend and I would like to know, do you believe in Jesus? Why did he let out a little sigh? Why was this guy who was ready to dedicate his life to share the love of Christ with other, other people, why was he reluctant to ask that question? If I came out there and asked you, why are you reluctant, what would you say to me? Because see, over here on this board, we have, many of us have, have written a name of someone that we would like to introduce to Jesus. Someone we would like to ask, we want to, I want to know, do you believe in Jesus? Now, some people have done very good at that, and, and we've been able to turn those others. Others have tried that and worked hard at it, and the people haven't bitten yet. But some of us, myself included, have found this little bit daunting to talk to somebody who isn't inside the church about Jesus. And I have to admit that I let out a little sigh, and while I've had some of these conversations with my one over there, it's, there's been a little bit of reluctance to broach that subject. Why? There might be a lot of different reasons, and there probably are many different reasons as there are people in this room, but let me explore one with you today. I think one of the reasons why I struggle in sharing my faith with other people is because sometimes God just doesn't make sense. It's hard for people to understand and I take comfort in knowing that I'm not alone. We read a Bible passage from Romans, the New Testament reading. We read a Bible passage from Mark, the Gospel reading. And if we were to read the Old Testament reading, we would find ourselves in Genesis chapter 17. And Abram's having a, a conversation with God. It's the second conversation he's had with God. The first one, God told him to go out underneath the stars and look up and count the stars, well can't. 
And he said, as many stars as there are up there, that's how many descendants you're going to have. Well, now, years later, the Lord's having another conversation with Abraham, and he still doesn't have a son with his wife, Sarah. And God says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And Abraham says something like this. He says, yeah, I know. I, I kind of took matters in my own hands here. And, well, Sarah gave me her maidservant, Hagar, to be another wife to me. And, well, she had a son named Ishmael, and that now is my, uh, that's my son. And God said, no, no. You're going to be the father. Sarah is going to be the mother. And we're told that Abraham laughs. God, do you know that I'm 100 years old here? And my wife is 90. She's never been able to have a baby, and she certainly isn't going to have one now. She's way past the childbearing years. That's ludicrous. Right? Peter struggled to understand. Here we just read that story about Peter, you know. Jesus said, who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. Blessed are you, Peter. What a great answer. I'm going to build my church on that confession that you just made. Not because you made it, but because it's the truth. And then in the very next paragraph in Mark chapter 8, Jesus is going to tell him, he's telling him how this is going to happen. He's saying, I'm going to die, and then on the third day I'm going to rise again. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus, how are you going to do that? You're the Messiah. We just talked about that. You're the Savior of the world. How are you going to do your Messiah thing if you're dead, huh? How are you going to be the Savior and do your Savior stuff if you're dead? That just doesn't make sense. He rebukes Jesus, and guess what Jesus does? He rebukes Peter, and he says, get behind me, Satan. Because you're thinking not with the mind of God, but with the mind of men. You're not thinking like God here. You're thinking like a mortal human being who thinks that they want to understand. Because face it, folks, when we start looking at this world, we start asking the same question. I don't understand how a God of love can let bad things happen. That makes no sense. It's ludicrous. I don't understand how God can use, um, you know, a guy like, like Abraham, 100 years old, to have a kid. That doesn't make any sense. That's ludicrous. I don't understand how God could use somebody like me, who's just an ordinary kind of person, to go and be a witness out in the world. Wouldn't it be better if he just had some kind of great sign or wonder, right? That's ludicrous that he would use me. And then we start thinking like this, I don't understand, and therefore, if I don't understand, it must not be true. Ask him the other question. Sir, my my friend and I would like to know, do you believe in Jesus? The inexplicable happened. To the horror of the guy sitting in the middle chair, the guy in the left chair turned beet bread. His eyes filled up with tears and they started flowing down his cheeks and he looked at the man in the middle chair and he said, I'm so empty. I'm so lonely. My life is so meaningless. Tell me about this Jesus that you're talking about. And this man in the middle chair started telling the man in the left chair all about this Jesus who did the most ludicrous thing you can imagine. He told him about the love of a father in heaven who did the most 
incomprehensible, ununderstandable thing that you can even comprehend. This Father in heaven sent His Son down to this earth to die on the cross for somebody like this, and somebody like this, and somebody like this. What kind of father would sacrifice his son for three mess-ups? They had this long conversation about the love of a God who does things that are totally beyond our understanding, things that we would think are totally incomprehensible, unreasonable, and ludicrous. When their time for the flight uh, to board their plane came, the two men exchanged information. When they turned to look and talk to the young lady, she was gone. They never saw her again. But a few weeks later, the man in the middle seat got a letter from the man in the left seat. And the letter said, I want to thank you for sharing Jesus with me that day. I went home, and I am now a part of a church, and my relationship with God has grown more than I can even tell you. And I got to tell you that I have more peace and more fulfillment in my life than I've ever had before in my life. I don't understand what's happened, but I thank God. Folks, in our lives, think about that for a second. Isn't it ludicrous that God would use a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman to have the child that would be the forefather of the Savior of the world? But He did. Isn't it ludicrous that God would send His Son, Jesus, to be the Savior of the world and that that Savior would die? But He did. Isn't it uh, ludicrous that God would die for someone who's messy and, and dirty and sinful like me and you and all of us? But He did. Isn't it ludicrous that God would use a young girl with Down syndrome to bring someone to Christ? But he did. Isn't it ludicrous that God would use you and me in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, or wherever we happen to be in our schools to share the love of Christ with other people? But he does. And isn't it ludicrous that God asks us to pray to him, a God that we don't see, we can't observe, we have a hard time comprehending him, and to bring all of our prayers to Him, and He promises He'll answer them. Isn't that ludicrous? But He does, and He will. This week, I told you we were in, uh, in Phoenix for a conference. And on Friday around noon, we had a, a speaker who spoke to us. It was actually a husband and wife team. And they told us this story of something that I just find absolutely beyond my comprehension. I, I could not imagine having this happen to me, much less even surviving it. They introduced us to their three children, and their oldest was an 18-year-old, vibrant, vibrant young lady, a dancer, uh, full of fun, uh, a practical joker, uh, the excitement and the joy of, of the whole family. And on one afternoon on her way home from a photo shoot, she was killed in a car accident. I can't comprehend the pain, can you? And then the father told us that on the day of the funeral, the other two kids were beside themselves in grief. And so as a father, he felt it was his job to wrap his arms around them and to comfort his children. His wife joined them, and he said, I can't explain it to you. I don't understand it. But at that moment, 
I could feel the presence of God. It was as though he put his arms around us all and held us tight. And I learned something that day. I learned that we don't have to understand God to receive his grace. Why not? Because what God is, is not of flesh and blood, but it's from our Father. He's God. We're not. We'll never understand Him. But He freely gives us His gifts. And so, my friends, now may the true peace of our Lord that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds from now until the day you meet Him. Amen.